Uh, this is the young adult uh, graphic novel panel. Uh, today we have Nicole Gu and P. Craig Russell. I uh, would also like to thank our sponsors, uh, which include the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, White Castle, uh, Columbus Foundation, UBS, the Japan Foundation, and our other festival sponsors. Uh, and as a reminder, which you already know, uh, all the programs at TXC are free to attend, and we thank you for your support. Um, so before I introduce, like I said, uh, you're here for the Young Adult uh, Graphic Novel Panel. Um, so today uh, we have uh, Pete Craig Russell. I'll just read uh, uh, brief bios for uh, both of them. Uh, Craig lives in Kent, Ohio, and has spent 40 years producing graphic novels, comic books, and illustrations. He's well known for his graphic novel adaptations of Neil Gaiman's Coraline, American Gods and Norse mythology, as well as, his, as well as his fairy tales of Oscar Wilde series. His work ranges from such mainstream titles as Batman, Star Wars, and Conan, to adaptations of classic operas, uh, fairy tales of Oscar Wilde, and Kipling's uh, Jungle Book series. He has won several Harvey and Eisner awards. Several, yeah, I yeah. mean, more than several, I mean. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> so please welcome so Craig. It's, it's been 50 years, not 40. Oh, <laughs> this is an old, uh, <laughs> let me correct. <laughs> yeah. um, Nicole Gu is an Eisner Award nominated illustrator and cartoonist from Los Angeles. She's the artist of DC's Shadow of the Bad Girl and co creator of Fuck Off Squat <laughs> at Silver Sprock and Bicycle Club. <laughs> She has been published by DC, Dark Horse, IDW, and Ani. Her most recent comic, Forest, Forest Hills Bootleg Society, debuted from Simon & Schuster in 2022, and, has an, and she has an upcoming graphic novel, actually, it's out already. Oh, yeah, also. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Pet Peeves, uh, coming out through Avery Hill Publishing in 2023. Her work often explores the themes of coming of age, interpersonal drama, and learning how to be human. Uh, please welcome Nicole. <laughs> and uh, both uh, Craig and Nicole have uh, tables here, right, selling yes. their work, and I believe you have a, a signing. I do. I have a signing right after this, but also I'm two doors down from that, so oh, <laughs> the okay. table's very close to the signing. Yeah, yeah, okay. And same with Craig. I think you're uh, a couple of tables over. Right? I think so, yeah. I'm yeah. at I'm 104 up there. Yeah, one okay. or two. So come on by and buy some stuff. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I wanted to discuss uh, the work you've done, um, obviously we're talking about uh, young adult graphic novels, both of you have done work in, uh, with general audience material, uh, but I wanted to focus first of all on the young adult uh, material you've done for mainstream publishers. Um, so Nicole, we'll start with you um, and speak about Shadow of the Bad Girl. If you can give us an idea of um, what the story is and how you got involved in the project and all that. Yeah, sure. Um, so Shadow of the Bad Girl, um, I don't know if you are all familiar with what used to be called DC Inc. and I think is now just DC Young Adult, um, is a, a line of mostly superhero origin retellings through a YA lens. And so our story is about Cassandra Kane, who, um, if you're unfamiliar with her origin, she's the daughter of David Kane and has been raised uh, to become an assassin. And she's never taught language, uh, only reading cues through body signals. And um, in our story, and also sort of in the original story, she essentially is on a mission, and she has a moment of clarity where she realizes what she's doing, and she breaks away from her father in the life of an assassin, and she runs away to go live in the New York Public Library, where she meets um, Barbara Gordon, and is inspired by Barbara's, uh, which she doesn't know it's Babs at the time, but her stories of Batgirl and the legacy of Batgirl, and decides to take a different route and discovers herself through learning to read and to communicate and to be the type of person that she wants to be. And um, I was able to connect with this work through, um, I was doing a show in Anaheim in California and an editor came by and I was 
showing her my work and she really connected with it and then I was then connected with the writer Sarah Kuhn who is a really wonderful YA novelist and she's done lots of books with DC and some other Star Wars things as well um, and we collaborated on design and some story and we were able to put the book together. Okay. <clears throat> so you did all the character design for the new? I did, yeah. And we created some new characters for DC through this story as well. So um, Cassandra and Babs are obviously legacy characters. So I was able to redesign them. But we introduced um, Jackie, who is like a mentor character, and Eric, who is kind of the love interest as well. And, and that's, that's, that's... That's Cass's homemade costume as she's trying to figure out how to be a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, so how long was the process of, of working on this project? That's a good question. My sense of time is very kind of loopy. Because yeah. when you make comics, you're just in your house making yeah. them by yourself for years on end. And it's actually mostly events like this that I, I track time by, oh, we went to CXC in 2023, or we did this. Um, I think I started it in about um, 2018, and then the book came out in 2020. So that is kind of start to finish getting the job, doing development, and then um, through publication. And there's often some time in between finishing making the book and the publication. Yeah. So you were working on the book while doing some of your other personal work? Or? I was, yeah. I was making, um, uh, my partner Dave Baker and I make books, and we were working on a book called Everyone is Tulip for Dark Horse that uh, actually was Eisner nominated. Oh, right, right. Yeah, so I was drawing two books at once, which is a thing I swore I would never do again, and uh -huh. yet here I am doing it again. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure it was dif uh, difficult to switch brains, right? From yeah, I mean, for me, it's less um, about switching brains as it is that I'm just a really bad multitasker. So being able to do all my work and finish the work that I need to do, for DC it was five pages a week. Um, and for Dark Horse, it was whatever you can get us by as soon as possible. Yeah. Um, so finding the time to work on the Dark Horse book when I have impending deadlines, very specific deadlines for another project, and kind of arranging schedule, time management is not a strong suit of mine. <laughs> yeah. uh, unless I have a deadline, and then I'm great at it. Right. <laughs> That's probably the same with most artists. Mm -hmm. Was that penciling and inking five pages a week? It was, yes. Ugh. Yeah, that but I didn't do the color. Question. The color, uh, the colorist is a woman named Chris Peters, who is amazing. Beautiful color. Yeah, she's wonderful. Yeah. That's a lot, right? <laughs> Craig, I mean. yeah, that is a lot. It is a lot. Yeah, that's like. But it, it, it takes yeah. so long to make comics that if you're not working at that pace, it just it's years and years of your life. Which, mm -hmm. if you're making work that's significant to you, is is good and meaningful. But uh, so much of the time, if you're doing license work or work for hire stuff, you want to be able to do it as quickly as possible so you have the time to work on things that you truly are passionate about. Right. Okay. That's great. It looks great. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And uh, have you done any more of uh, the Bad Girls? Uh, we haven't. We've talked about it, and I think both Sarah and I are interested in it. It's that timing, again, is very difficult because books take so long to make, so I've I've had kind of a Something, I'm, something else I'm working on for the last several years. And we do have people ask us fairly regularly if we're going to make another one. Because it did pretty well, right? I think so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, it's all about timing. And again, what kind of you are um, putting your time and energy towards and, and what your goals are for that. And while I love Cass, I also love creating my own stories. And that's kind of where my focus is right now. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Um, all right, uh, Craig, so you've worked with Neil Gaiman many times over the years. 30 uh, years. 30 years? Wow. Yes. That's amazing. Um, and so the uh, graveyard books, are, those are definitely YA, uh, I right? would say so, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, can you fill us in a little bit on, on the, first of all, what the story of mm -hmm. the books is? Um, and you know, maybe a lot of people have heard already, but how you ended up working with Neil Gaiman and developing such a close collaboration? Well, uh, my first sort of interaction with Neil um, was when he called me about doing the 50th issue of Sandman. And uh, 
one of the one of the first things he said to me, which was sort of like looking into the future, I had no idea at the time. The year before, I had done an adaptation of a Jungle Book story called Red Dog uh, for Eclipse Comics, and he saw that and told me that he thought that was one of the best adaptations he'd seen. So that sort of figured into our future collaboration because Sandman 50 was an original script. You know, I wasn't uh, editing it or doing anything like that. But that's our first uh, interaction was on that. The irony is that the Graveyard Book is Neil's, you say, take on the Jungle Book stories. Oh, okay. So Bod, Nobody Owens, uh, after his family is murdered, wanders into the graveyard, uh, and this was based on the Highgate Cemetery uh, in London, that incredible Victorian cemetery that's so wide and deep and forested with all the incredible tombstones that they had. And instead of animals, Bod is, is uh, nurtured by ghosts. And so it follows Jack, the, 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 there are a whole slew of people named Jack, and this particular Jack is the one that's after Bod, just as Shere Khan was after Mowgli. Uh, I had already been working on Jungle Book stories, both at Marvel, inking Gil Kane's uh, four Jungle Book stories, and then at the request of uh, Joe Duffy, who was an editor at uh, Epic, uh, Marvel's Epic, uh, wanted to do one together. So we did The King's Ancus. And that was a, a collaboration in which I was going, following, you know, his story, and, and she was doing the final script as a ghostwriter because she was under contract, so she never got credit for it. Okay. So I try to make up for that every time I'm asked about this. <laughs> and then the next two I did completely by myself. Yeah. And um, so that's what sort of tied in with Neil and brought me into that. So this. It, there's eight main stories, just as there are eight uh, Jungle Book stories, at least with Mowgli, and follows the, uh, the arc of that. So since it was such a large project, it was over 350-some pages, what I would do, and since Neil trusted me to know how to do an adaptation, I could take his novel and, and do the, the script from his novel, and, uh, which is what I did, and then laid out all the stories, we had a whole slew of artists, and I did, I was going to lead off with um, the opening story, but once I, once we got Kevin Nolan on board, uh, parts of it take place inside the family's house in the very beginning at this, this murder, and I love the way he draws doorways <laughs> and, and baseboard and, and just the interiors of houses, so I gave that one to Kevin to lead off, and I took the second, which Bod then is about five or six years old. Okay. So you're following him, you know, as as he ages uh, through. And as I had the same sort of thing with uh, my three Jungle Book stories. I started with the sixth of the of the eight, and my model at the time was about 14 years old. And then for Red Dog. It was a couple years later. He was 16, and then I took pictures for the spring running when he was about 18. Didn't get to it for a number of years, but I got all that reference. So, and then in the graveyard book, his nephew became uh, Nobody Owens in the very last story. So it's kind of a family affair. Yeah, yeah. and we'll be looking at some uh, some of the Jungle Book pages uh, later on. Um, so you, you said you laid out uh, both books all on your own and then you, yes. you decided who to give the assignments to right. based on their strengths? Well, um, I'm sorry, what was that last Well, based on their, you know... On their strengths, yes, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> early on with that Sandman story, when I was talking to Neil on the phone, he said, you know, he casts artists, you know, who, who would be sort of right for this. And I did a book called The Thief of Baghdad, again, the year before. And um, now that I think of it, that's what precipitated Sandman 50. Uh, it was an illustrated book of the novel Thief of Baghdad, written in the 1920s. Uh, so he saw those illustrations of 
this mythical Baghdad, and he said, I want you to do it like you did Thief of Baghdad, only more so. Uh, and uh, he let me know that's why I was being cast as this artist. He said, now, if, if Charlie Vess was doing it, I, I'd write in a genie. And of course, my artistic ego was, I can draw genies. <laughs> but that, that was the, be, the beginning of, and, and it's only because I did this illustrated book a year before that he saw. Just timing. Yeah. yeah. And I'm sure he knew your work. And, well, he knew like the Jungle Book story, before, right, sure. yeah, yeah, he did know. And all the yeah. Kill Raving and all that other stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so who else was, uh, forgive me, but mm. what other artists were in the... Well, uh, Jill, Jill Thompson okay. uh, did one. Um, I always tried to get her, I mean, she did for uh, Norse mythology, she did a story which was just, I think, the highlight of the, the whole series. Uh, uh, Kevin Nolan, um, Michael Golden was in for a while, and then, then he wasn't because he wasn't doing anything. And we had one of those things where um, we had to all get together and do the very last story in about three weeks. So Galen Showman uh, and I penciled the whole story, and, and Kevin Nolan inked it. Okay. And it was like, let's put on a show, and it has to be done in two weeks. Um, Scott Hampton was the um, Olympian of the whole thing. The climactic story, or penultimate story, is a hundred pages long in the graphic novel. And he did all of it in record time. And another artist, well it was Tony Harris was doing a story and he was falling way behind and our deadline was really coming up. So I found, in, in looking over the, the layouts, it was about a 40-page story, I think. Uh, I could see a spot where we could bring in another artist and uh, up to this point, and it perfectly fit, and Scott Hampton came in and did 20 or 30 pages of that, finished that before Tony was done. But Tony's work was beautiful, but we had to, you know, rush in. A uh, Galen Showman, who uh, has lettered about a thousand pages of mine, did a 50-page story in it. It was just beautiful work. Um, I know I'm, I'm going to leave somebody out here. Um, well, I, I may think of it, yes. That's okay, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and some of those are uh, some of your collabor like collaborators for, I don't, you know, a number of projects, right? Galen well, and, and yeah, Scott. Yeah. Uh, Galen, I think, is just one of the most terrific letterers in the business. I mean, it's just beautiful lettering. Um, and then, yeah, Scott Hampton and I have uh, uh, worked together uh, on American Gods and um, uh, the uh, Graveyard Book and some other Neil stories. Um, who, uh, trying to think. Uh, well, uh, go ahead. Something I just forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> you can think about it later. We can go back. Um, so uh, let's move on to some of the work you've uh, generated on your own. I'm sure that's the stuff that's more meaningful. Uh, well, so it, well, yes and no. I oh. mean, um, I've had the privilege of. Um, pretty much being able to, everything feels to me self-generated. I mean, in working with Neil, I read the stories and yes, I want to do it. It's not an assignment sort of thing. Uh, but there are others that, uh, like the Jungle Book stories, uh, when uh, Joe and I finished at the King's Ancus, she presented, she presented the idea of doing it to Archie Goodwin for Epic Magazine. And he said, um, that's not really what Epic does. So we found e uh, Eclipse Comics said they would do it and we did it and finished it and she showed it to Archie and he said, well, we could have done this. <laughs> uh, so uh, as long as you know you can find a publisher to do what it is you want to do, uh, that's how that got going. Okay. And um, with the fairy tales of Oscar Wilde, I was playing around with a more animated style with um, a story I did called uh, A Trip to the Moon by Cyrano de Bergerac that was just whacked out kind of cartooning. And I wanted to do more in that vein, and I approached Terry Nantier of NBM, who has their table is here, uh, about doing a, a, a whole book in that, that style. 
And I had this Oscar Wilde fairy tale, The Young King, that I'd wanted to do for years. And he said, well, why don't you just do all Oscar Wilde? So that was self-generated. And there are nine of those. I've done eight, and there's one to go. Yeah. And we'll, I have some slides that for Younger Book and, and Oscar Wilde. Mm -hmm. um, but so Nicole, can you tell us a bit about the, the how this book came about for sales? For sales, yeah. And um, what it's what the story is? Just sure, yeah. Um, so my partner Dave and I have been working together for a long time, and um, we tell a lot of stories of c that are kind of coming of age and about um, the trials and tribulations of high school and dating, and we kind of live in that space. And the thing that's nice with working consistently with the same writer is that they um, kind of know what your interests are and they know what you like to draw and we spend so much time together that we just talk about story all the time and um, Forest Hills came about from uh, kind of bits and pieces of our own lives, um, things that we wanted to talk about, people that we knew in high school and we put together the book. It's, it's about a group of high school girls in about 2006 I think is the year. Um, that start a bootleg anime distribution ring in their very conservative high school. And so it is about kind of this very um, textual time period for us because it was when we were growing up, uh, but also about the ways that um, having this business breaks down these girls' friendships and what it's like to figure out um, dating and your sexuality and, you know, having a friend group who is not as excited about you as you are about them and <laughs> all of those kind of really difficult things that we kind of grapple with as we're growing up um, and, and also the, how the pursuit of popularity is maybe not the right thing to be looking for when you're in high school. Um, so we were trying to deal with all of these issues um, and speak to things on a very specific but um, universal level and that's kind of what we strive through for in all the books. So we, um, the way we work is we brainstorm a story together, we talk about story and then we, Dave will go and sit down and write a script and then we do lots of editing passes where we, we actually um, uh, read the whole thing together. He'll do the scene direction and I'll do the characters. And we make notes and we uh, form the thing and make it what we think it needs to be and oh this character wouldn't do that or I think this it would be funny if we had this scene over here. Um, and uh, we put together a pitch when you're um, when you're trying to make a book with uh, kind of the book market publishers which is a separate side than the direct market which is your normal um, books that you'd find in a, you know, weekly in a, or monthly in a comic book shop. Um, you have to send a pitch, which is essentially a synopsis and some sample pages, and we sent it around to some companies and were able to get it picked up at Simon & Schuster, and then we kind of set out to just make the book, and um, after many, many script passes, uh, I was able to sit down, and I, most, for the most part, I will just then sit down and make the book for two years. Um, with some input here and there from editors or from Dave, and um, it's a it's a very long and intensive process. But uh, when you really love the characters that you're working on, it, it can be super joyful. And Dave's an artist himself. He is, right? yeah, yeah. So he writes for me. He also writes and draws his own books, and he writes for other uh, cartoonists as well. Yeah. Um, do you find that? Is it easier to have a partner who's also an artist working on these books? I think it is. Um, I've worked with people who are only writers as well, and I've had really good relationships with them. Like um, Sarah Kuhn, who wrote Shadow of the Batgirl, is a wonderful collaborator, and she really listens and she understands story and comics. And um, it's interesting that that YA line from DC, many of the writers that they got to work on that project are people who come from YA prose. And I think sometimes when you bring people in from a prose writing perspective, they have to learn the language of comics. And because Sarah had done a couple projects before in the comics world, she understood the language, she understood what it was okay to ask me to do, she gave me a lot of freedom. Um, but I do think when you are working with someone who has the experience of drawing themselves, they're gonna be a little bit more understanding about what fits on a page and what should be a splash page and right. pacing. pacing and impact and how many word balloons you can put on a page, which <laughs> is very important. Right. Um, 
I imagine that uh, adapting things yourself, it's nice to be able to make those decisions and... Yeah, I letter it all out yeah. on the page. I, I letter mean, rough, I'm not doing the final, but I know where it's going and there's room. I used to try to um, draw pages and then just drop word balloons on top afterwards, mm -hmm. which is the way a lot of people do oh, work. Yeah. Uh, but I now put balloons in my thumbnail process as well as my pencil process. I, I letter as I go because yeah. I... I'm just not good enough to estimate how much space you need, really. <laughs> and you end up drawing a lot of stuff that gets covered gets up. Covered yeah, in. exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I really like the your layouts in this book. The, Thank you. Uh, some yeah. Really, really interesting uh, uh, setups. Uh, uh, is the process for a book like this different than something like uh, Shadow of the Bat as far as like your storytelling? Uh, I think uh, Shadow of the Bat Girl was a learning process for me definitely because I'm not usually someone who draws a lot of action no. and I'm not also not someone who draws a lot of cities and this takes place in a, uh, it's in New York, there's lots of cars, there's a library with lots of books. So it was definitely a challenge because I was having to learn to draw all these things I wasn't used to drawing. Um, but I would say that's kind of the case with every book you work on, unless you're only doing you know, the same house in the same place. you know. Um, but I think in terms of my kind of outlook on formalist uh, comics and trying to be inventive with panel layouts and tell story, that is cross genre for me. I, I do that whenever I can and I think sometimes it's more successful and sometimes it's not. Um, and I think a little bit with Shadow of the Batgirl because they started writing that project before I was brought on, uh, I maybe didn't have as much influence into some of the stuff that is kind of infused into the, the writing part of um, things like Forest Hills because Dave is also very interested in formalist comics and the layouts are all mine, but sometimes it's like, oh, what if we did this mechanic here, or what if we tried that? Um, a lot of the, uh, this book is full of caption boxes that are very just kind of non-important, but very descriptive information about the characters, and that's something we've been developing for a couple of books. Um, so can, you just, can you talk a little more about that? Yeah, so um, it started in our book, I'll say F Off Squad, um, <laughs> uh, where we will have you know, panels where people are having a conversation, but there is just kind of miscellaneous information about the characters. So it says, you know, missing their left sock, or these are their favorite shoes, or mm -hmm. uh, would really rather be watching Hellraiser than doing this, or you know, this kind of extra information that is not essential to the story, but gives you kind of textual information about the characters and their lives and the environments that they're in. Um, so we've kind of been honing that um, style of comics making and that, that mechanic for a couple of books. And then in Forest Hills, we have kind of this combination of both the floating captions and then these uh, caption pages. So it's kind of like a mix of prose and comics. Like where, this one, yeah. Yes, like this one. So it's um, kind of a, a little um, paragraph or essay about something about the character that's outside of the kind of sequence of events that's happening in the story. Do you do something like that for each character in the book? Or? Yeah, yeah. Some of them have multiple of those pages, so it's kind of just a way to. I feel like sometimes when you're telling stories in comics, because of the nature of breaking down moments, you can't tell as much in the same amount of pages or same amount of space that you would in a prose novel or something mm -hmm. like that. And so this is our way of upping the density and the information about our characters. Um, and so this was definitely a little bit experimental for us to put these kind of essay pages in the book and yeah. try and up the density and in information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Makes them richer. It, yeah, exactly. I, I, I get frustrated sometimes. I'll have, I'm working on a 250 page book right now mm -hmm. and I still feel like I don't have enough space to yeah. tell everything that I want to tell. Yeah. And it takes so long. <laughs> <laughs> I love that idea though of all these little asides yeah. that just give you something about the character. I think it, it really just helps to make you feel like you know the people mm -hmm. in the book. And it helps us as creators know the characters and understand what choices they would make. And it's maybe something that is not essential, but adds to the, the story. Right. Sure. And I'm sure it changes the pacing for the reader as well, right? Mm -hmm. you, you yeah, it slows you down. It slows definitely. you down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're not like, 
one of, one of the most frustrating things about making comics is spending two years of your life making a thing and then having someone read it in a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yes. That's, what, that's what I mean, yeah. 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 Well, it, we don't have the control of time no. um, that you do in a, in a film or, or anything other than that. Um, although people can stop and, and take their own time, but at the same time, they might just rush through. Mm -hmm. I've done silent comics, completely wordless, but I'm aware that a single word in that can slow them down, mm -hmm. and so you can control the pace or have a little bit of control. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think also the, the page turn in comics um, is a, one of the, the page turn, the gutters, and um, adding text are kind of three mm -hmm. of the major ways to really control the pace at, what, at which your reader is reading. But other than that, you, you really have very little control yeah. because it's, very, it's a very self-directed medium. I kind of think of the, the page turn as almost like stanzas in a poem, mm -hmm. that each page sort of stands on its own and, and at the end leads you forward, or like the last story of, I mean, the last panel of a serialized thing just has some little bit about it that is a cliffhanger or a sudden spark of interest. Mm -hmm. So as you're laying out the books, you're always conscious of the page turns all yeah. throughout the process. Yeah. Right? Well, with uh, uh, American Gods, which was 27 issues since it was serialized, um, and it, it's at, at once a, a full-fledged novel, and it's then serialized, but, but I know that it's going to be published later in a collection as a full-fledged novel. So the, the game that I had to play was that every 20 pages, and I, I don't suppose I really had to do that, but it, I just felt like I should, every 20 pages that it rounded off that, that issue in a way. And it, was, it might be right in the middle of a chapter in the novel, you know, at the end of a paragraph or something. So it had to then still at the same time flow into the next page when it was done as a novel. And we had a real close call in, when they first collected it. They were just sort of putting the issues together you know, that every 20 pages there would be another cover. And so I said, no, 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 we've got to take out all those covers and now just meld it all together. And you can put all the covers in a gallery in the back. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've noticed, I work mostly in graphic novel form where you, um, some of our books are chapters, some of them are not, but you are giving it to the reader as a, an entire chunk. And I, I have noticed a trend in monthly comics um, in the last, I don't know, 10 years or something, where I feel like things used to be much more episodic. You used to get more of a kind of rounded out story in mm. your single issues. Um, and you can still put them in a trade and have it be readable as a full story. But so many, and I find this in TV actually as well, um, we used to have so much more episodic TV and now there's such a shift towards serialized that when you're buying monthly comics, a lot of the time you're not getting a satisfying ending or mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be an ending, but like a, a feeling like a full story or arc of something um, within the single issue. And, and balancing that, being able to tell a serialized story but have a satisfying end to each issue, I think is a real skill. It, 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 yeah, it's a challenge to mm -hmm. do that and to make it look seamless. Yes, absolutely. And, and you're not just ending page 20, you know, in the middle of a conversation yes. with nothing else about it than <laughs> if someone just turned off the sound. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that must also be a, a challenge with adaptation specifically because you are working from a big story. Right, especially so, something like American Gods. Mm -hmm. But like with Norse mythology, uh, those were separate stories, yeah. but some were very short and some were much longer. Mm -hmm. So in serializing that, it just uh, sometimes we'd have the break right in the middle of the book. Here's the next chapter. Mm -hmm. All those while still trying, even in those four pages, to have something at the end that propels you into the next. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I um, just wanted to move on to, again, the work that, you know, uh, I don't want to say self-generated because yeah. you know, you're in, uh, made that point, but I mean, I feel like the, the, the Jungle Book stories were like a real labor of love for you. Oh, they were. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I loved the stories to begin with. I read them as a kid and I saw Disney's totally different adaptation 
as a matter of the, the story is that when Walt uh, said they were going to do the Jungle Book, he gave uh, a copy of the book to all of the lead animators, and he said, now I want you to go home and not read it. <laughs> <laughs> means they were going to go on their own way yeah. about it. Uh, I'm, on the other hand, I'm very faithful uh, to the original source. Uh, I, I know adaptations like, say, Kubrick's The Shining differs so from uh, King's, but he does it, it, he makes a masterpiece out of it. I, I, I don't think you have to do uh, you know, faithful adaptations for it to be good, but if it's really good source material, uh, I see no reason to make any substantive changes. It's just the challenge of making it a work in this visual form, of taking that pure prose and make it work visually. And that's enough of a challenge for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How long would it take you to adapt a, a single story for uh, Well, this would have been about 30 pages, or no, um, it was maybe about 26 pages. Okay. Uh, I worked a lot faster then, uh, so probably um, two or three months, okay. you know, because I was also inking it and um, doing the original color on the first two Jungle Book stories, and and so I was doing wearing three hats there. So this well, is your color on this page? Uh, no, now this is the from the the last the third story, okay. and Lovern Kanzerski colored oh, this one. This okay. is the spring running. Did you go from um, prose to script to thumbnails, or did you kind of thumbnail as you were oh, adapting? Oh, I, th I thumbnail as I go along. Mm -hmm. I, I will make a Xerox copy of the open book on 11 by 17 mm -hmm. paper, so I have all these big wide margins. And then I, I kind of roughly think, okay, there, here's a page and here's a page, and I'll, mm -hmm. okay, can I make that work as this? Sometimes there's like three lines and that's a page. Right. Uh, depending on what you can edit out. And then I do little, tiny little storyboards almost, mm -hmm. not even designing the page, but how many uh, panels is it going to take to do this action? Yes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's way more than I need, and then I say, well, these three, can this, can I combine them in one panel? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and then I'll, I'll break that down into little sets and then design the page. It'd be interesting to see those sketches. Um, oh, the I wanted chicken to include scratches, some, of, the, <laughs> some yeah. of them. I mean, when I did the Ring of the Nibelung, uh, I, I laid that, it took me six months to lay that out because it was 400 pages and over 3,300 drawings. And I had all my little chicken scratches, so by the time <laughs> I got to a point towards the end, I remember looking at this one little thing. And, and you forget what it is. It looks like somebody standing between two rocks. <laughs> Why is it? Well, it turns out it was a close-up of a face. I mean, <laughs> and a nose. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to show some pages from the uh, artist edition that you put out, uh, oh. uh, Jungle Book. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, here's something. Could you go back to that one? Yes. Uh, I was working with the Fawcett edition of the Jungle Book story uh, for the King's Ancus. And uh, it was some years later, said, someone said, well, I really like that, but why did you leave off the ending? I said, what are you talking about? Well, um, you know, when he uh, returns the Ancus uh, to where it came from, I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, I went back to the Fawcett. They had not printed, there was a printing error. So it was years later that uh, I did these two pages. Okay. You went back for and for it. yes oh, for a, a, a new edition of it. Sometimes you just have very little control about what publishers are doing. Yeah, yeah. you thought that they must. This is signet paperback. They must know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is from Red Dog, um, the second of them, and this is the first one I scripted uh, myself. And um, this is from, yeah, the spring running that I, I did many years later. Now, if I remember correctly, you got a grant from the High Arts Council. Yes. Originally, right? To, right. To um, for Red Dog. Okay. And I, I got one a few years before for Peleus and Melisande. Oh. That was for Eclipse. And one of the great things Eclipse did, they would, they would just, well, they didn't pay much. But so they said, do whatever you want. So I found this play by Maurice Metterlink, who was a very big 
literary deal at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. He won the Nobel Prize in 1910, and he wrote this play that was made into an opera by Debussy, and it's just a fabulous, I've read this thing um, sitting on, a, on a, a rock ledge in the snow because I picked it up for 35 cents from the Kent State University remainder sale, and I read this thing, and it's just, it's just great. Uh, so uh, I did that and uh, applied for a grant from the Ohio Arts Council, and I didn't go because they had, um, it was reviewed in public. Yeah, I remember those. Yeah. Then I said, I don't want to be in the audience for that. Um, <laughs> And as a matter of fact, I heard from a friend who was there when they said, okay, this next person does comic books, and they like snickered. <laughs> and uh, like, oh, this ought to be good. But I had you know, all these pages from it that they could look at, and, and um, that made all the difference, and I got the grant. I probably, maybe the first. I imagine so, yeah. For what, something what like that. What year was that? Uh, that um, let's see. That was, uh, I, I number my things, so Ladies. that was like Opus, Opus 21. So it was right after uh, the King's Ancus. Um, Mid-80s, yeah, yeah wow. easily, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can imagine um, getting serious government grants for comics at the time, right. even now. <laughs> even, yeah, well, it's w way more. Well, I remember uh, thinking how great that was that they actually you know, gave you a grant. And I thought, well, if anybody was going to get the grant, you. Well, you, know, you just I mean, you don't know, but um, and this is a, a complete uh, off off the side. But years later, um, you know, uh, Coppola did Francis Ford Coppola did Dracula, and a big art book came out on the art of Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula. And I'm leafing through it, and they did a lot of you know um, inspirational art like they do for animation ahead of time. And there was this beautiful swipe of one of my panels from <laughs> Paleis and Melison. It was a big kiss scene with this sort of swirling around it. Oh, wow. And uh, did it make it into the film? The I don't know movie? if right. yeah, I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I'm sure there was a kiss in there someplace. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, well, we have a few more Ooh. minutes. A few minutes left for questions. If anybody has questions, mm. uh, yes. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I was wondering. Uh, with comics, typically when you're, you're producing a comic, you have a pace limit very early on in the production. Even with graphic novels, you know, uh, very early in the stage, mm -hmm. you'll have how many pages are in the book. But with literary adaptations, obviously, mm -hmm. it must be a lot harder to determine just how many pages it would actually take to do an adaptation. Well, you have to accommodate yourself to the format sometimes. With Eclipse, they, that was going to be a 32-page comic. So I, I could do it really to any length up to, and including 32 uh, if I wanted. So I was able to just find what, you know, the sweet spot uh, for it. Um, I did a, a Batman hothouse in Legends of the Dark Knight for DC, and the script that I, um, Archie Goodwin, the editor, sent me was supposed to be for one issue, and I, there was just so much going on it, and I said, could I have two issues? And he said, yes, so, you know, I was able to get that accommodation to spread out a little bit. So do you usually have free reign with the, the length of the adaptation? Um, yes, yeah. Um, again, within that serialized form, but um, I, we did three, knew we were doing three volumes, so yeah, it, it, it comes out where it comes out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, I am an illustration major and a comics minor here at CCAB, and I'm wondering what, like, do you guys have any drawing exercise recommendations that help you kind of with poses, with shading, with background that would be beneficial? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't do as much of that anymore because I spend so much time drawing books themselves, but um, I started doing life drawing from a really young age, and I think any time that you're drawing from life, um, whether it's an actual life drawing class or if you're out at a, a cafe drawing people or environments, um, studying environments, especially if you want to do comics. Uh, I, as a kid, I was the person who just drew a character standing with a peace sign, like with no background at all. So when I started making comics, I really had to learn to observe environments in a way that um, 
I hadn't done before. And, you know, instead of putting people in a room that looks like a box, you go, oh, there's alcoves and there's this type of window and, and really observing anything where you can be observing real life, specifically from life and not from photos. I mean, the photos help as well, but um, there is a difference in um, your perception of volume and shape that comes from working from life that you just don't quite get in the same way. Um, but any type of observational drawing, I think, is really helpful. I could see that in your work, that you know how to draw without, you know, <laughs> looking at or trying to make it photorealistic. But when I was looking at, at the one, I thought there was a car in there, and I know drawing cars, that well, she had to look at something yeah. through that. <laughs> took, took some learning to draw the yeah. cars. <laughs> and now, now sometimes I will draw them from memory, and sometimes I'm like, I just can't do that angle. I'm going to look <laughs> yeah. up this car. Cars. Or, or even, cars. Um, I know the idea of car, but there's details about a car or specifics about a car that make things feel um, more textural and real um, that maybe you wouldn't think of if you're just thinking of idea of car versus observing an actual car and what the, the details of that specific mm -hmm. thing is. Yeah. Cars and horses. Horses. Cars oh, horses. horses. Yeah. Yes. Cars, yes. horses. I've drawn so many libraries. <laughs> <laughs> uh, horses are, are probably more difficult because you can, it's much easier to get reference material for a car. Mm -hmm. I was doing a Conan story and I take pictures in my gallery on the second floor and this guy that I met at the gym was and he was coming over and I said right, okay I'm doing this scene and I set up this thing with a whole hamper and things with a saddle on it said this is going to be your horse because I I can't get a horse upstairs ha ha and he said mm -hmm. I have a horse amazing <laughs> and he had a horse so we went out in the field and got actual reference that's wonderful that, that's but you can't rare. count on that all the time yeah i mean a lot of people will do things like you know you can buy toy cars and then you can see them from every angle yeah or toy horses but then you can't pose no. them and it's yeah. you know not very realistic yeah. <laughs> uh, i think we'll maybe time for one more yeah. uh what made you decide to choose a career in comics mm. Uh, I actually went to school um, in initially for drawing and painting. I wanted to be a life painter and then realized that I needed a little bit more direction and the work that I liked to do was not quite in that vein and ended up in um, illustration. And so I thought I was going to be an editorial illustrator or really anything I could do that I could make money making art. Um, and I wasn't planning on making comics. I had read a lot of comics as a, a younger person, but I hadn't in a while. And I met my partner, Dave, and he asked me if I wanted to make some short comics with him. And I was, I think, working for a toy company, and I had some free time, so I initially said no. <laughs> uh, but we made some comics, and then I started going to zine fests and fairs like this and seeing kind of the breadth of what comics could be. And I think the combination of making our first book um, which we just Xeroxed, we made some mini comics, we Xeroxed it and sold it at, um, there was a teeny tiny convention called Zine Melt uh, in LA that is no longer exists. I think there were four tables there. But being able to have a printed uh, physical copy of my work and give it to people and interact with the people that were kind of taking my work home and enjoying it um, really felt connected in a way that I had never felt with any of my art before because so much of it had either been personal work or work for school or, uh, you know, something that got sent off into the universe and I never got to see who was uh, interacting with it. And particularly with shows, that one-on-one -on -one connection that I've able to have with comics has just really been kind of like, it's like crack for me. <laughs> like I just love being able to talk to people and meet people who are um, interested in the work that you're, may be, that you're making and maybe being influenced by or, or connecting with it, you know, is really kind of wonderful. Okay. Oh, the same way. Uh, real serendipity. Um, I was going to school at the University of Cincinnati studying art and had no idea what I was going to do with that. I was in my second or third year. And back in my hometown of Wellsville, Ohio, it was right on the Ohio River, there was an article in the East Liverpool Review, the next town up, that this artist for Marvel Comics had moved back to Ohio, living in Glenmore, another little tiny thing about three miles away. And uh, it was Dan Adkins, and that's his family was from there. So I went out to meet him, and actually, I didn't. My dad did. My dad had a clothing store. So he had needed need a little piece of art for an ad or something. So he went out to see Dan if he would do it, and Dan didn't want to 
have anything to do with it. But Dad told him about his son who has 8,000 comics up in the attic and is going to art school. And Dad said, tell him to come out and meet me. So I did. I don't know if I would have had the nerve to do that. I was a shy kid. So I went out and I showed him my work. And he said if I would work with him for six months, he could get me into Marvel Comics. That's because my dad needed an ad. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, and, and so that's what happened. I worked with Dan, and he brought along Val Merrick and Paul Galassi for this sort of Ohio studio that he was doing, and we would do the work there, and then he would edit it sort of and show us what's what, make corrections. And it's the first time I ever had real concrete um, instruction of uh, years of the university, a lot of it was, you know, just do what you do. And uh, Dan would, it was the first person who looked at her drawing and said, no, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And here's how, here's how the knee works and, and this thing, and he'd do a little sketch. Mm -hmm. And that was a shock to my fragile little ego, <laughs> you know, to have to erase stuff and do it again. Uh, but I learned how to edit myself yeah. that way. Wow. That's amazing. Well, I think mm -hmm. that's all the time we have. Uh, let's give these guys a round of applause. Oh. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And Nicole has a signing uh, at 2 o'clock? Yeah, now. <laughs> no, right now? Yeah.